This is episode number three with Ben Greenfield. Hey everyone, it's UJ Ramdas with The Mental Edge, and today I have for you Ben Greenfield. I first met Ben down in Colorado, and he really inspired me because he was so focused on physical and mental performance. He's a 10-time Ironman triathlete, he's an ex-bodybuilder, he has a background in exercise science and physiology, and I'm such a fan of somebody who practices their biohacks on a daily basis. Ben's really great for that, and he's got a ton of cool tips to share with you. We talk about heart rate variability, about cold thermogenesis, about what five biohacks you would take if you were stranded on an island. This is really cool stuff I think you guys would enjoy. So I hope you enjoy the show as much as I had recording it. And if you're listening to this, please leave a review on iTunes. I'd love to hear your feedback. Anything I can do to improve the show would be wonderful, but I'd love to hear what you enjoy about it. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, let's get on with the show. Ben, welcome to the show. So Kona was your last Iron Man. Yes, Kona was, oh, well, it was my last Ironman, and it was my last Ironman, yeah. <laughs> right, so can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Sure. Um, that race is the one that you see on TV. It's Ironman Hawaii. It takes place on the big island of Kona on the side that is just all lava fields and black rocks. I tell people it's kind of like racing in hell. <laughs> and uh, it's just this, this super duper hot and fast day. It's all the best Ironman triathletes in the world come and we, we go to battle for the day. And um, it's just a, it, it's, it's a very um, taxing experience. At the same time, it's, it's really kind of a big mental rush because you know you're in, the, you're in basically like the Super Bowl of the sport, the Super Bowl of triathlon. And so I, that was my fifth time doing that race. Um, and because it was my, the last Ironman that I plan on ever doing, I I kind of had this this dual goal of posting a, a decent time, but also kind of like enjoying the day, yeah. you know, like enjoying my last Ironman experience. So, um, so yeah, it turned out to be pretty good. I I finished in under ten hours, which is always a a, a goal for me when I'm out doing an Ironman triathlon. And um, now I'm, I'm on to other adventures, so we'll, we'll see where, where the road goes next. Very cool. And what fueled your decision to make this your last Ironman? Uh, you know, there's a lot of, of amazing things on planet Earth that one can experience. <laughs> and when you're always trying to, to be fit for, for an Ironman triathlon, no matter what, it does take some time. You know, it takes some time on the weekends. There's some pressure um, it, it beats up your body a little bit. I, I am not one of those guys who says that it's, it's healthy. It, it probably takes seconds or, or days or, or weeks off of my life every time I do one. Um, I, I used to be a competitive tennis player. I really want to get back into the, the tennis circuit. I homeschool my twin boys and want a little bit more time to do that. Uh, there are some other skills I want to pick up. I'm working on getting my pilot's license right now. And, you know, I'm I'm one of those guys who likes to experience life, UJ, and and just like get out and do as many things as possible. So, for me, I've done ten Ironman triathlons, and I'm I'm cool with that. I'm ready to to kind of go out and do lots of other things too. So that's great. And last time we met, you mentioned you track your heart rate variability mm. everywhere you go. And yeah, I think my audience would be fascinated with the science behind it and and what you use it for. Sure. So, um, the the basic idea is that you know when when you are 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 being built essentially in your mother's womb, there is this connection that forms via what's called the vagus nerve between your everything up inside your skull and your entire central nervous system, and your your heart and your cardiovascular system, and it's called your heart brain connection, and your heart and your your brain talk to each other um, all day long, and and both of them create their own electrical field. But the the heart's electrical field is actually about thirty times greater than that of the brain, and the feedback of the vagus nerve into the heart is something that you can actually measure. Now, 
what what the the reason that it's important to measure that is because there's there's two different components of your nervous system. You have your sympathetic or your fight and flight nervous system, which is your running from a lion system, and then you've got your parasympathetic or your rest and digest nervous system. And um, the vagus nerve can be stimulated by both components of the nervous system and feed into the heart and affect the actual beat of the heart based off of which part of that nervous system happens to be predominant at the time that you're, that you're taking a heart rate variability measurement. So the way that you measure the electrical activity of the heart is you can either use like a, a wireless uh, Bluetooth sensor um, or you can use an actual uh, dongle that attaches to the bottom of a smartphone. So you wear a heart rate chest strap, and it's either going to talk to your to your smartphone or to your portal via Bluetooth or via that dongle. And what happens is your your strap that you're wearing measures the amount of time that is spent between each beat of your heart. Now, in a a bad scenario or a scenario in which you have a poorly tuned nervous system or you're stale, or you're overtrained, and you've kind of like like overworked yourself from a stress standpoint, or perhaps an exercise standpoint, the variability between each heartbeat is very, very constant, meaning it might be, you know, 0.03 milliseconds, 0.03 milliseconds, 0.03 milliseconds, in terms of, of the time spent between each single beat of your heart. And that would be what we call low heart rate variability. And if you're testing your heart rate variability and it's low, that's a sign that your body might need a rest day. It's a sign that you might be stressed out. It's a sign um, in some cases that you have a sympathetic nervous system dominance, meaning that and, you're, you're, and, you're constantly stressed out or that you've, you've, you've overtrained your parasympathetic nervous system. Both of those can cause that low variability. Go ahead. Right. Now, so how long would you have to be in, in low heart rate variability to actually qualify for a rest day as opposed to being mm. high coherence, coherence all day? So that's a great question. So uh, if, if you test your heart rate variability, let's say on a day that you're supposed to go out and do a hard exercise session or you've got a, a tough, stressful day planned and you go and push through that day, you can string yourself along and make it through that day. But for every consecutive day that you continue to do that, not only is your heart rate variability going to stay low and get lower, but you can also predict with very good accuracy how quickly you're going to get sick or you're going to get injured based off of you pushing through that score. I personally just never push through it. Like if I wake up and my heart rate variability is low, unless I am purposefully digging myself into a hole, which from a training standpoint for something like a race you occasionally have to do so you get a hypercompensation effect as you as you you basically stress out your body and then hypercompensate but unless I'm purposefully trying to do that which I rarely do throughout the training year I just I, I take care of my body on a low HRV day so basically um, you're saying anytime you see lower HR, HRV you just stop everything and you just do you rest till you get back up to coherence it, it might be a day where say I like go for a nice easy swim or like a nice relaxing bike ride along the river like something scenic and relaxing but it's not going to be a day where I go do treadmill sprints and kettlebell swings and you know th things that are going to be super stressful to my body and especially anything like anaerobic um, now, I mean, you, you can get a little bit more scientific with it. Like you can look at the frequency, what's called high frequency or low frequency. Like I use a heart rate variability measurement system called Sweetbeat. And that, that's the name of the app that I use. And there is on the dashboard of that app a little arrow that you can push that takes you beyond just your heart rate variability score, which is a score from 0 to 100, but also shows you your high frequency score, which is the input from your parasympathetic nervous system, and your low frequency score, which is the input from your sympathetic nervous system. And you might see that you have, for example, a really, really poor low frequency score, meaning really, really poor input from your sympathetic nervous system. And that would be a pretty good sign that you might be able to go out and do a, a kind of taxing parasympathetic nervous system activity, like a, say like a long aerobic workout, but you probably shouldn't get into anything anaerobic that day at all because your sympathetic nervous system is giving you feedback that it's really beat up. 
So you can dig in even more and, and kind of decide which component of your nervous system you're going to stress out on that day based off of the frequency score. So how do you tactically measure this? Do you have a chest strap on that wirelessly talks to an app or a machine? Yeah, yeah. so for me it's, it's five minutes in the morning and what I use is a Polar H7 wireless Bluetooth heart rate monitor because I like to have as few pieces of equipment as possible. So that means that when I have that monitor attached, I don't have to have the dongle on the bottom of my iPhone put in. Um, so that is just, it's just the Polar H7 plus the app that I use is called the Sweet Beat app. The other option is you use a regular heart rate monitor like a Garmin or, or a Polar that's not a Bluetooth or like a Timex or whatever. And then you have what's called an Ant Plus adapter. And you can buy these off of Amazon. But you put the Ant Plus adapter into the bottom of your smartphone and that allows you, you to talk to a, a heart rate monitor that's not Bluetooth enabled. Got it. Okay. And coherence, high heart rate variability is not the same as relaxation. Right. Um, it it kind of is. Okay. Uh, so so if you, for example, let's say you know your 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 viewers and listeners are familiar with like the Heart Math Institute yes. and the concept of of coherence training and bringing your body into a state of coherence by doing biofeedback and visualization and relaxation and, and meditation. What you'll find is that any time you get into a state of coherence, your heart rate variability goes through the roof. And so. Um, you know, ideally, you are achieving that that relaxation and that that tuned nervous system through a combination of using active biofeedback, meditation, visualization, etc., along with taking care of yourself from a rest and a relaxation standpoint, from like exercise and stress. So you've got both high, high heart rate variability and high coherence as well. Great. So, and I know you're a fan of cold thermogenesis because I remember in Colorado, you were spending yeah. about 30 <laughs> minutes swimming in the freezing cold water. Um, what does your what your cold thermogenesis protocol look like right now? Yeah, so so I use cold thermogenesis or or CT um, with some of the fat loss clients that I work with to allow them to shed fat faster because what you do when you expose yourself to cold water, cold water immersion, cold temperatures, or even um, we'll even use things like the like this vest called the cool fat burner vest that allows you to to get ice plates over specific brown fat areas of your body. But what you do is you actually cause activation of stuff called brown fat tissue or brown adipose tissue, BAT. And that actually burns calories to generate heat rather than burning calories to generate ATP, your body energy currency. So what you're doing is you're upregulating your metabolism by forcing your body to have to stay warm. Um, now, I personally, because I'm a naturally lean guy and I exercise a lot, I don't use it for fat loss. I use it for other reasons. Um, it can control inflammation, so it can lower levels of what's called HSCRP, which is an inflammatory marker. It can also lower levels of cytokines, which are the molecules in your body that produce pain. Now, so is this inflammation you're referring to specifically related to gut health? Um, no, this would be this would be skeletal muscle inflammation Got from it. exercise. Okay. So, um, interestingly, though, if you are experiencing uh, brain inflammation from like a, a leaky blood brain barrier from the use of pharmaceuticals or alcohol um, or or stress, um, if you're experiencing like um, uh, what other forms of inflammation, gut inflammation, this isn't going to affect so much. Um, well, primarily, to be honest, it's mostly brain and skeletal muscle inflammation would be the two the two forms of inflammation that it would have the greatest effect on. Um, but it, it can control that as well. Um, it also makes you tough. It, it increases your tolerance to pain, um, which for me comes in handy when I'm out beating at my body. You know, I was doing Ironman or whatever. It's ironic, but cold thermogenesis can help, actually help me handle heat a little bit better. And that's not just because of the increased pain tolerance, but also because it upregulates something called endothelial nitric oxide synthase, or ENOS. And that is the molecule that's responsible for, for vasodilating your blood vessels to allow for better oxygen and glucose delivery to working muscle and working tissues, but also to have a cooling effect on the body. 
And so by doing cold thermogenesis, you can actually equip your body to perform better in hot conditions. You know, say if you're going to go out and do like whatever, an adventure race in a hot area or a triathlon or something like that. So what I do is uh, cold water showers. I do cold water immersion. And then I also actually use like the gear, like compression gear that has ice packs in it. Or I use this, this cool fat burner vest. Um, and pretty much every single day, I'm doing I'm doing some form of cryotherapy or cold thermogenesis. And how many? How, how long does that take you? How long do you do cryotherapy? There, I, I I don't have a set number of minutes that I shoot for. I just work it in as as a daily practice. So sample day for me, I dip in the morning and do a five minute shower. That's twenty seconds of cold water followed by ten seconds of hot water ten times through. That's a total of a five-minute shower with these 30-second cycles. By cycling hot water and cold water, you actually enhance that nitric oxide effect that I was talking about, that right. cardiovascular effect. You could just stand in a cold shower for like five minutes and still get, get pretty good effect. I'll repeat that type of showering scenario, but typically not do the hot-cold contrast and just do cold water later on in the day after my workout. I work out in the afternoon or evening because that's when your body temperature and coordination tends to peak. And then I'll follow that up with a cold shower to cool my body down um, for two reasons. Number one, you sleep better when, when you cool your body down. And you can also have better sex later on in the evening. Um, you know, if you've, if you've got a partner or, or, or a wife or a husband at home, um, the, doing, doing the cold thermogenesis later on in the day can enhance your sexual experience um, later on in the evening by cooling your body. So it also comes in handy for that. But for me, typically, it's a couple of cold showers or, or cold, hot kind of cycling back and forth. And then during the months of the year that the river that's by my house is not super duper cold, like when it's not below about 40, I'll go out there and either stand waist deep or do full body immersion for anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes, you know, and sometimes I'll actually do a workout. Like I'll, I'll go in there and, and combine like freestyle swimming with, with cold water immersion. Um, I keep the house kind of cold. Uh, usually I keep the house between 60 and 65 degrees. Um, it kind of returns to, to like what Nassim Talib talks about in his book, Anti-Fragile, where... Hormesis. Just, yeah, hormesis. We've kind of lost our ability to um to 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 get a lot of the longevity and um you, you actually have these these components of your cells called telomeres the shorter your telomeres get the shorter your, your life basically becomes and you're actually able to keep your telomeres longer or cause them to shorten at a slower rate by exposing your body to certain levels of stress that stress might be the hormetic stress of fasting or caloric restriction, caloric restriction but it can also be one big one yeah exactly it can also be the stress of temperature fluctuations being okay with getting kind of hot sometimes or being okay with the house being cold a lot of the time um so i'll do that uh i also like go outside in the morning on like a, a day like today like crisp fall morning and i'll do like 10 to 15 minutes of yoga when i get when i get up um Cold thermogenesis works really well when you combine it with, with a hormetic stress such as fasting. Um, if you wake up in a fasted state, you get even even more effect. It also works really well with caffeine. So if you can get in like green tea, yerba mate, a cup of coffee before you start into like a cold thermogenesis session, um, that'll speed up fat loss results as well, specifically if that's the reason that you're doing cold thermogenesis. Very interesting. The only thing I do right now for cold CT is uh, I take a cold shower, straight five mm -hmm. minutes, straight cold. Yeah. Anything else yeah. you'd recommend or any variation? Well, that's like the most convenient way to do things because hopefully you're, you're going to be taking a shower anyways. <laughs> um, but, you know, nothing beats cold water immersion. So like, you know, cold shower is not cold water immersion. Mm -hmm. Nothing beats if you live near like an open body of water, okay. like a river or a lake going out and doing, you know, it's basically the ancient like Native American yeah. practice, you know, where they throw their kids in the water to make them tough. And, 
you know, like the Cherokee warriors used to do this, and they had some of the toughest fighters on the face of the planet. And a big reason for that was because these kids would they they're used to like these icy cold lakes and rivers, and that's how their parents made them tough. Right. Um, I haven't found anything that beats cold water immersion when it comes to accelerating the the effects of cold thermogenesis at as fast a rate as possible. And that even include like I've I've even done like the fancy schmancy like cryotherapy chambers where they've got like the like the super Super duper cold. Um, it basic, basically, it's like this this chamber that you stand inside, and they they inject this really really cold air into the chamber. I haven't even found that to be as effective as cold water, and I suspect it's because of the pressure that the water places against the skin mm -hmm. when you're actually underneath the water. So it's also that's, the thermal the thermal way. effect of of the water on skin. Yeah, yeah, right. probably. Thermal especially conductivity. especially if you move if you move your limbs while you're submerged. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So uh I I saw this new biohacking device called Push for mm. measuring strength. Yeah. And I think it measures specifically force, velocity and power. What do you think of this? Yeah. Yeah. Um I haven't got my hands on one yet. I've got a meeting with them on Monday actually, um, because uh, and, and you and I have been talking about this a little bit about like mass gain, strength gain, yeah. stuff like that. I think it could be really helpful for for quantifying um, not so much mass gain, but like the strength and power that you develop as you might be trying to put on muscle. Right. And so, because for me during the triathlon off season, I usually try and get a strong like bull, so to speak. I think that if I that if I use something like that to actually quantify the strength and the power, rather than using the old school method of just like writing down, you know, your your weekly bench press score or whatever, I think it could be cool. But honestly, um, I'm not even sure what they have in it. If it's like an accelerometer that they've built into the unit to quantify speed of movement, um, or or how exactly they're doing something like measuring force, because typically. Like if I were going to measure force on, you know, like my my bicycle, it's an actual strain gauge that's on the crank. Yeah. Um, but from what I understand, this is not like a wearable strain gauge. It's more of like a like a wristband. So it's I'm an not arm quite band, sure. I okay. Think. So if it's an armband, um, you know, it it might actually be a strain gauge. I would just question, you know, what what you know, if if you're having to wear one on each arm, if they're if they're assuming kind of like some bicycling power meters do that, if your right arm is generating X amount of strength, that your left arm must also be doing the same thing. Um, I'm interested to dig into it, honestly. That it's it's brand new, so I haven't experimented. Yeah, with it. I was interested in your experience with that, so I guess we'll yeah. circle yeah. back up on that yeah. later. Usually at this point, I like to change it up and switch gears and go to some rapid fire questions. I think it really helps the audience get a better sense of uh, our audience and it helps you kind of loosen up a bit. So sure. um, here we go. Do you have a biohack story gone wrong? <laughs> uh, probably like cold thermogenesis. I mean, honestly, not to, not to kick a horse to death, yeah. but like the first time I, I kind of experimented with like the cold water swimming, I swam for like a half hour upstream. I got out of the water, I blacked out, um, totally lost bowel control, you know, uh, shat myself, um, barely was able to drive home and sat in the in the warm bath for like the next four hours. So uh, there, there, there's definitely uh, a, a rule that you need to ease yourself into something like that. But that was probably the worst experience for me. I've never really, um, you know, I've, I've, I've burnt skin doing electrical stimulation, um, but nothing super duper bad, just like first degree burns on the skin from the, from the electrode patches that you place on there. Um, nothing, nothing too major, man. I've never wound up in the hospital yet. <laughs> Surprising. Not, knock on wood. So, so yeah, um, cool. that's about it. Very cool. Well, if you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Oh man, anyone dead or alive? Uh, let me think. Let me think. Let me think. I would probably do. Um, um, I'm, I'm thinking of. There's, there's just so many dead guys. I'm, I'm a voracious reader, and there's a lot of authors who I really respect. Um, probably. 
I would say um, I think Mark Twain would be a cool yeah. guy to hang out with. Um, funny, smart dude. Um, I love his writing style, um, you know, and, and I love his quotes and everything. I think he'd be a fun dude to, to hang out with and have dinner with or, or something like that. So I'll, I'm going to say Mark Twain. Cool. Uh, that actually leads in well to the next question, which is what are your top three books of all time? Uh, top three books of all time would be um, the Arthur Conan Doyle uh, Sherlock Holmes series, oh, yeah. um, J.R.R. Tolkien's um, Lord of the Rings trilogy, and then um, C.S. Lewis's uh, science fiction trilogy. Um, uh, what is it? The uh, I forget the name of that trilogy, but if, but if you, uh, it's, it's been a few years since I've read that one. It's it's uh, it's three books, obviously a trilogy. Uh, but it's written by uh, by C.S. Lewis. That's a really good one too. So cool. Now a pretty consistent theme of every every guest who's on my podcast is people are voracious readers. I'm curious, how many books on average do you go through a, a year? Um, I usually read about three to four books a week. Yeah. So right now I'm reading um, Alignment Matters by Katie Bowman, which yeah. is a book about uh, posture and alignment. I'm reading um, uh, Velocity of Money, which is more of like a workbook, textbook mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of works through uh, Velocity of Money. I'm reading um, a venture capital book. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it's just a, uh, it's a really good venture capital book. And then I'm reading um, on my Kindle the book Why Isn't My Brain Working? Um, and then typically that that's combined with with listening to about 10 different podcasts a week. So I don't know if those count as books, but it feels like it. Yeah. It <laughs> so um, so I, I, I read a lot. Um, I'm a speed reader. So any given year, I'm usually going through 200, 250 books around there. Very cool. And um, what's, your, what's your most unpleasant job you ever had to do? Uh, straight out of college, I was uh, a, a surgical hip and knee sales rep. <laughs> and so I, I stood in surgery with a laser pointer as the docs were cutting into mostly obese people uh, who had destroyed their hips uh, through a combination of a sedentary lifestyle and weighing too much um, and showing them how to how to take um, take those people's hips out and replace them with overpriced titanium components. Uh, and I absolutely hated everything that job that job stood for um, when it comes to modern medicine and everything that's broken with the system along with the sad fact that I was looking at people who had broken their bodies by misusing their bodies and having to see everything nasty that went along with that. So I thought it would be a cool job because I was you know, totally geeked out on anatomy and physiology and medicine in college, but it turned out to just be kind of depressing. So. Ouch. And uh, complete the sentence, I lose track of time when blank. Playing my guitar. Cool. That was quick. And uh, do you have any addictions? Um, my morning uh, green kale smoothie that I put organic dark chocolate cacao nibs into, yeah. uh, along with a little bit of cinnamon, Brazil nuts, almonds, uh, sometimes a touch of almond butter, some coconut flakes. Like I have the same thing for breakfast every morning and uh, have not yet uh, <laughs> become unaddicted to that. That's great. What's your favorite source of information? Uh, podcasts. Cool. What are some of your pet peeves? Um, uh, people who are flaky, who start any projects with me and don't finish up. Uh, that happens to me a lot and <laughs> annoys the heck out of me. Um, what else? Uh, um, I'm not a big fan of cats, believe it or not. Uh, so they're kind of a pet peeve. Yeah. <laughs> um, and people who uh, who drive poorly, um, not necessarily people who drive fast and recklessly, because a lot of times those are the best drivers on the face of the planet. Uh, but people who typically are like slow drivers are usually bad drivers too. Um, so inattentive drivers kind of annoy me as well. Nice. Have you ever done drugs? Uh, yes. Cool. But nothing, nothing too. Major <laughs> or, or highly illegal. As a matter of fact, uh, any any drugs that I have done beyond like smart drugs and herbs and stuff like that are now legal in the state of Washington where I reside. So <laughs> <laughs> works. And what are three things you're grateful for right now? 
Uh, I'm grateful for um, the fact that I, uh, I just was able to spend a fantastic week and a half in Hawaii with my family and toss in an Ironman while I was there. I'm grateful that uh, later on after our talk, I'll be uh, grabbing my, my bug out bag in my tent and heading up on my lands to, uh, to camp out overnight and shoot a deer tomorrow morning to have meat for the winter. And I'm grateful that um, I'm grateful I'm on my I'm on this call right now with you, EJ, because I I actually really enjoy uh, like new media, podcasting, video stuff like that, and just being able to to geek out on this stuff. So right now, those are the three things I'm grateful for. Definitely, Ben. The gratitude is definitely mutual. Cool. Um, what are your blog post talks about the most important exercise you will ever do in your life, and I'm a big. Mm big fan of that exercise. Could you explain to the audience what that is and why it's the most important exercise they will ever do? Yeah, it's push-ups. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, it's an exercise called uh, Your Perfect Average Day. And when I first did this exercise or first discovered this exercise, um, I don't remember who introduced it to me, um, but what what I did when I when I learned how to do it was I sat down, isolated myself. For me, the first time I did it was on a plane where I'll end up doing a lot of this stuff just because I'm unplugged and disconnected. And you walk yourself through from the time that you wake up in the morning and your eyes open to the time that you, that you hit the sack at night, what your perfect day would be that you could live with over and over and over again for the rest of your life. Like... What what would you eat? Who would you be with? What kind of activities would you do? Um, you know, how would you be interacting with your family, with your friends, with your clients, with your coworkers? Um, what would your work look like? How would you be enjoying yourself after work or during work? You know, what would your hobbies be? What would you go out and play? And you go through and just map out everything, like the perfect day for you, and and you write that all down. And once you finish it. What happens next is kind of magical because you begin to change your life, your practices, your conversations, and your goals to try and chase making that day a, a doable day for you every day. Um, so, so for me, for example, and, and I've done the exercise twice now, the second time that I did the exercise, um, I really ended up being incredibly focused on my children. And and how much I wanted to be able to spend time with them, you know, I, I homeschool them, and so the number of hours that I wanted to spend with them in the morning, the things I wanted to do with them in the afternoon, in the evening, um, and uh, since since the second time I've done the exercise, the amount of quality time that I've just naturally began spending with my children um, has been amazing, and it's it's just been really rewarding too, and. You know, it's not like I've I've necessarily I I never really wrote down like I want to spend three hours a day with my kids or anything like that. But instead, I just completed the perfect average day exercise, and by the time I finished writing everything down it and looked at it, it was like you know, yeah, I mean, on this perfect average day, I am indeed actually spending you know three plus hours with my kids, just playing and learning and teaching, and so um, it's just a really really cool fun way to. To map out your life and and uh, so yeah, it's called the perfect average day exercise. And why did you do it twice? Um, the the first time that I did it, I felt like so uh, so I, I do a lot of soul searching and you know when I wake up in the morning and I'm doing like the the heart rate variability exercises, I'm thinking about my day, my happiness, what I want to accomplish and. The first time that I did it, I thought I'd really nailed what I wanted my perfect average day to be. And I realized after about six months that it really like that really didn't reflect the way that I wanted to be. Like some of the some of the clients that I'd written down that I wanted to be working with, I was finding that that, that type of clientele and that type of work that I was doing with that clientele actually wasn't making me happy. The the way that I was spending time with my kids wasn't making me happy. And so I just went down and, and redid the whole thing. So, um, you know, I, I probably will redo it again, honestly, like towards the end of the year too. I, I think it's something that you can kind of keep building on and reinventing. Very cool. And I'm actually very interested in your take on mental performance and, and really upgrading your brain really. And mm -hmm. you mentioned one of the 
there are two steps to fixing your brains. One is balancing your neurotransmitters, and the second is fixing the HP axis. Can you talk a little bit about those? Sure. Um, so, f from from a neurotransmitter standpoint, I, th I think that most people are probably aware that neurotransmitters are the primary me means by which your neurons communicate by releasing chemicals across the synapse from one neuron. Uh, and having the chemicals taken up by by basically a, a postsynapse on the next neuron, and when you are depleted in neurotransmitters, or when you have a neurotransmitter imbalance, say um, you know too much uh, too much dopamine relative to to gamma immunobutyric acid, what happens is you end up getting brain fog, you end up getting depressed, you end up being demotivated to do certain things, you end up getting appetite cravings, having trouble sleeping everything like that. So balancing your neurotransmitters and providing your body with adequate neurotransmitter building blocks is really, really important for the health of your brain. Um, depletion of neurotransmitters can occur through everything from a diet that is inadequate in terms of the amount of whole amino acids that are present in that diet, especially amino acids that can be kind of tough for your body to make itself, like uh, taurine is a perfect example of, of something like that. Um, not that I advocate downing cans of Red Bull all day long, but you know, uh, meat is a, is one of our primary sources of of, of taurine, um, and you, you can you can supplement with taurine as well. Um, another way that it, that neurotransmitter depletion can happen is through sensory overload. You know, watching too many scary movies or watching a lot of action movies, especially late at night. Um, going out to the clubs too much, getting exposed to those bright lights, um, listening to your music too loud throughout the day, or listening to music that's just very disruptive to you uh, psychologically. There's all sorts of ways that we can shove our brains in hyperdrive and deplete neurotransmitters via that way. Lack of sleep can deplete neurotransmitters, exposure to chemicals, toxins, pollutants, heavy metals, you know, dental work. All of this stuff that, that we get exposed to can deplete neurotransmitters. So um, one thing that's really, really important is that you balance neurotransmitters by getting adequate sleep, by not overstimulating your senses, by eating you know whole protein sources and really nutrient dense foods, um, and even by if you want to, um, you know, using using herbs and chemicals that can help you to to maximize neurotransmitter production. Um, you know, using like uh, serotonin and dopamine precursors, using like uh, you know like a dopamacuna supplement, or using like 5-HTP and L-tyrosine. Like there are all sorts of neurotransmitter repletion supplements that you can use, or even smart drugs that you can use that amplify neurotransmitter production. Um, another another really important one is, for example, acetylcholine, which is something that, that, for example, many of these smart drugs that are out there these days um, amplify turnover of. And so you could do thing something like take, uh, uh, like I use club moss extract, which is uh, full of something called huperzine A, which which really sparks up the brain but uses up your levels of, of something called choline really, really fast. So I'll combine that with something like a, like a fish oil or walnuts or some other choline source to make sure, make sure that I cover my bases. So what's your favorite of sources stuff, of choline? I just use a fish oil. I use one called Super Essentials that is not only not only has the natural choline from the fish oil in it, but also has a little bit added in. And then the Hooperzine extract that I take has a compound called Cytocholine in it. Which which also um, helps to replenish that. So I get that from a from a supplement called T and Chi. Um, the uh, the other thing as as far as as the uh, the second part of of fixing your brain or optimizing your brain is concerned is the HPA axis that stands for your hypothalamic uh, um, uh, pituitary adrenal axis. And what that is is it's it's the interaction between your hypothalamus, your pituitary gland, and the adrenal glands that sit on top of your kidneys. Now, the HPA axis can become highly dysfunctional, typically in response to hypercortisolism or stress. And so, um, basically, sleeping adequately and living a stress-free lifestyle. Um, as, as airy fairy and woo woo as that may sound, are, are two of the best ways to fix the HPA axis or to address HPA axis dysfunction. Um, you know, biofeedback, neurofeedback, even controlling excess cortisol production through the use of things like Chinese adaptogenic herbs. 
um, you know, acupuncture, uh, tapping, um, meditation, things of that nature can all help with this as well. Um, even like like uh, like uh, Tai Chi, yoga, all of that stuff has been clinically proven to reduce cortisol levels. But really focusing on that as well as focusing on you know going after that that holy grail kind of eight to nine hours ish of sleep a night can really really help with H- with uh, HPA axis dysfunction as well. So. Um, yeah, you put all that together and, and you can really create a really nicely functioning brain. And speaking of sleep, what's, what's something you recommend to your clients? What, what's a good time to sleep and what's a good time to wake up? Is it, does it depend on the person? Does it depend uh, on where they are in the world? It, it can depend on the person and where they are in the world, meaning that, for example, um, you know, you, you'll, you're, you're going to find that your circadian rhythm might change based on the amount of, of travel that you do. Like for me, when I'm in Hawaii, for example, this past week, you know, I, I go to bed at eight and I get up around four, you know, and, and and for me, that is what my body naturally does when I'm in Hawaii. Whereas here at home, you know, I go to bed at 10 and I get up at six. So um, in an ideal scenario, we would go to bed when it gets dark and we would get up when it gets light. But in post-industrial era where we have lights and computers and screens and stuff, that's generally not that conducive um, to work or social life. So um, I recommend uh, that, that you go to bed at least prior to 10. If, you, if you're in bed after 11, you're really limiting the, the amount of melatonin that you're going to produce um, and the amount to which your core temperature is able to decrease during the night. And so when that happens, you don't get as much neuronal repair because what your body does is it lowers your core temperature while you're sleeping and that allows for your neurons to repair and to to recover. It allows for memory to form and for lots of cool things to happen from a nervous system recovery standpoint. None of that happens when you go to bed really late. And for most people, that's after about 11 p.m. because you need to have been asleep for several hours by 2 a.m., which is when that core temperature starts to dip in order for that to happen. So if you're going to bed after 11 p.m., usually you're not asleep long enough by the time 2 a.m. rolls around for you to have adequate melatonin and adequate levels of another really important hormone called leptin to be present in your hypothalamus to allow that core temperature to, to get down to where it needs to be at or for that healing to occur. So that's one really important thing. Um, I'm a fan of, of, of kind of sort of doing a little bit of biphasic sleep, meaning typically, you know, if, if you get like seven and, a half, seven and a half to eight hours on a night and then you can squeeze in like a 30 to 45 minute nap um, either at 11 a.m. or 3 p.m. Those are the two best times of day to nap from a circadian rhythm standpoint. Um, what happens is is you kind of get double rest in and... I find that for me that works out really, really well. I usually go at 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. and then usually either like a pre-lunch nap or a post-lunch nap, kind of like a mid to late afternoon nap. And um, the way that I nap is is very similar to the way that I sleep. I do sleep mask, earplugs. I used a, a pulsed electromagnetic therapy field device underneath my mattress, which amplifies the natural frequency emitted by the planet Earth. Um, Earth resonance frequency. Is called, no? Yeah. So you get that 7.83 Schumann resonance emitted by by Earth, and what happens is if you're not in contact, if you're not sleeping on the ground, you really don't get as much of that healing resonance emitted into your body. And so I actually have uh, this this magnet. It's called an Earth pulse, fittingly enough, that I put underneath the mattress. And that magnifies that Schumann resonance and allows my body to soak up a lot more of that when I sleep. So I turn that on when I nap and when I sleep to allow for recovery. Um, it allows for a little bit more enhanced mitochondrial repair. And it also kind of gets you into your delta, um, your delta relaxing brainwave a little bit more quickly. So it literally emits a frequency that, that slowly takes you from alpha into delta and then from delta back into alpha as you're getting closer to the time that you've set for it that you want to wake. So, those are some great sleep tips. I'm curious to know what are your top three biohacks for upgrading mental performance. 
Mm. Um, I would say number one would be those Chinese adaptogenic herbs that I mentioned, like the huprazine and the cytocholine. Um, that T and chi stuff that I use is mixed with eleuthero and rhodiola and ginkgo biloba and just a bunch of other either brain anti-inflammatories, adrenal stabilizers, or straight up smart drugs. So that'd be number one. Um, that's one that I take nearly every day, mid morning, empty stomach. Um, another one would probably be um, uh, for for me, it's it's literally like brain aerobics, mind games. Um, you know, there's a guy named Jim Quick who teaches a lot of really good ones. There's another lady named Arlene Taylor who's who's got a lot of really good ones on her website. Um, I like that kind of stuff, and I see the value in it. But for me, I like for things to be more practical and enjoyable. So for me personally, my brain game is three times a week. I uh, I do a guitar lesson, and I have books that I work through, songs that I learn, and that actually sparks the sections of the brain responsible for memory, learning, anticipation, thinking ahead, stuff like that. So I played violin for 13 years, found it to be an incredible mental stimulant, Switched to guitar um, just because that got me more girls, and so <laughs> <laughs> than violin, uh, surprisingly, and so um, I I do guitar now, um, and and that's that's kind of another another big mental boost that I do is um, is I use music to spark the brain not only for learning but also for uh, for just kind of tapping into a section of of the mind that that responds really really favorably. To, uh, to to you know the dopamine release and everything else that you get with music, so I'd say smart drugs, playing a musical instrument, um, probably the last or, or the best uh, brain hack that I do, um, I would say would be um, like memory work, um, having something that you actually memorize, and that could go hand in hand with the music that you're doing. Um, for me, I like to do quotes, verses, things of that nature, but having something that you can memorize and forcing your body to memorize things can be really, really useful. Um, so uh, you, you can also do like um, just really, really simple techniques where you, you, you do like use like word association to memorize 20 random words, for example, and you do that two or three times a week just to focus on the memory. Crossword, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, stuff like that can also work. But forcing yourself to memorize at least something every week um, is another really, really good brain hack, kind of an aerobic game. So that'd be another one. Very cool. Have you had any experience with binaural beats or hypnosis? Yeah. I use binaural beats sometimes when I sleep. So if I'm not using earplugs, I use these soft headphones called sleep phones. And um, I've done a little bit with the Dormio sleep app. I've got a binaural beat soundtrack that I downloaded off of iTunes that I'll, that I'll put through those headphones. So I primarily use those for, for sleep, um, not necessarily for, for alpha brainwave activation prior to performance, which is another thing that you can use them for. But usually I'm too busy socializing before I, uh, I exercise to, uh, to, to do that. Um, what was the other part of that question? Um, hypnosis. Oh, um, no, I have had many people attempt to hypnotize me, and I have yet to have ever been successful with, with being hypnotized. Um, I, you know, the closest I've ever come to that was um, the um, NLP, and I have been able to successfully create anchors that I use during exercise with neurolinguistic programming, but I've never actually been hypnotized, even though a lot of people have, have tried to hypnotize me. I just haven't ever been able to reach that state of hypnosis so fascinating i know you work with clients and are you a fan of functional labs and blood work so i'm yeah. curious because i'm a guy with a decent background in science what kind of training would it take for me to learn how to read and interpret lab results legally <laughs> <laughs> so legality um, is, is yeah, irrelevant yeah. to me you, you do technically i mean you 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 want to make sure that if you're going to do stuff like that you have professional liability insurance sure. and and all that jazz but uh to to learn how to do it you could go through like uh functional diagnostics and nutrition they have a good program for learning how to read blood work um, there's another one, um, and, they, and, and these are actually schools. I know there's one in Seattle. There's one in Portland. I'm totally blanking on the name. It's like the, the uh, uh, Medicine Nutrition Association or, or something like that. But you, that's like a six-month program. Um, 
I do a 12 month program. I have one called superhumancoach.com where I put people through a 12 month program that's like performance, fat loss, digestion, recovery, brain, sleep, hormones, and we really focus on biomarkers and uh, blood marker evaluation, some parameters to look for as far as that's concerned as well. Um, usually you can get your head wrapped around the stuff after about six months or so of learning. But then it's a matter of, you know, like for me, any given week, I'm usually looking at the the blood work and the biomarkers of at least a dozen and sometimes 20 to 30 folks. So, right. you know, I work as a practitioner for Wellness FX out of San Francisco. So they send me a lot of their CrossFitters and triathletes. Excuse me. They're um, <laughs> green smoothie. They're, uh, they're, they're exercising folks, so I, I really specialize in especially working with athletes, looking at biomarkers for athletes. Um, and then my own clients, a lot of times I'll send them, my, my, my lab of choice for them if they don't want to go through Wellness FX is another uh, lab kind of wholesaler, and that's direct labs. So I'll do a lot of testing through direct labs as well. And then there are some tests that you that you can get that go above and beyond just basic blood markers. So when I say basic blood markers, what I mean is like a lipid panel for cholesterol, a thyroid panel, um, a hormone panel for testosterone, estrogens, sex hormone binding globulin, stuff like that, white blood cell count, red blood cell count, liver markers, kidney markers, electrolytes, all that stuff is basic biomarkers that you'd see on a blood count. But then you can do things like look at uh, bacterial imbalances or bacterial overgrowth by doing like a breath test um, from breathtests.com where you drink a, a glucose solution and you measure the amount of gas that bacteria is producing in conjunction with that to be able to diagnose whether or not there's a bacterial overgrowth. You can do what's called a GI effects panel uh, that's made by a company called Metametrics that allows you to look at any type of uh, floral imbalances lower down in the digestive tract along with like parasites, yeast, fungus, um, you know, any opportunistic organism growth in the actual gut itself, you know, the, the infamous poop test. Um, you can also look at food allergy tests um, like the ALCAT or the ELISA test. Um, the, the immunoglobulin test, you know, any of these are like food allergy tests or food intolerance tests that let you kind of customize a diet. So, um, you know, there's so many different tests out there. I mean, like Cyrex is a really, really good What's lab that does like lots of tests for gluten sensitivity. Three to four like that. tests that you use, that you could use to diagnose uh, someone. Yeah, the so um, let's say somebody were just coming to me and they wanted to to kind of do like a done for you protocol. I'd say go to Direct Labs. They have one really good test there called the Top Ten Tests. Um, the equivalent for that at something like Wellness FX would be their Performance Panel, not their baseline panel, but their Performance Panel. Um, and then you combine that with a GI FX. And if you are someone who is having trouble with brain fog and sleep and stuff like that then the last test that you'd throw into that is like a third test would be a what's called a neuroendocrine profile and the neuroendocrine profile will test your levels of neurotransmitters or the balance of neurotransmitters um, I would love to be able to throw a for fourth in there and that would be a spectra cell analysis which is more of a micronutrient measurement of, of things like uh, red blood cell magnesium levels, your antioxidant levels, fatty acid levels, uh, organic uh, amino acid levels. Um, that's kind of a spendy test but it also from like a micronutrient standpoint can tell you a ton. So we're kind of getting into the territory where if you were to do um, something like a like a, a, a full-on blood count with the wellness effects performance panel or the direct labs top 10 tests plus a stomach test using like the GI effects panel plus a neuroendocrine profile plus a spectra cell you're looking at spending about 1500 to 2k but that would tell you everything that you'd ever need to know about your body um, if you really wanted to just dial everything in very cool and so I know you have a lot of things on your hands. You're working on an upcoming book. You have a pretty active blog. You run Endurance Planet in Pacific Elite Fitness. And you coach clients. You compete. You have two kids. Uh, clearly, you would know a thing or two about being productive. So what are some productivity mm -hmm. tips you'd, you'd share with our audience? <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
set up habits, set up routines, um, get enough sleep and exercise, first of all. So as ironic as it seems, I'm sleeping a little extra and then carving out like some time during the day to exercise actually makes you more productive, not less productive. And then um, I use Evernote and I basically have a system where I've got a bucket for each day. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, each are associated with specific, specific tasks. So like Tuesdays and Thursdays are consult day. Wednesdays is podcast day. Um, Tuesdays are the day I shoot video. Monday is my catch-all day for random activities or learning new tasks or exploring new websites. Saturday is a day that I do a lot of work with clients and look at a lot of client files from workouts, things along those lines. Um, Sunday, I do a lot of writing, uh, blog post writing, things of that nature on that day. Um, so what, what happens is each of those days has an Evernote document associated with it. And so the tasks that fall into the category for that day get put into the Evernote document for that day and then checked off or removed when they're actually complete. So when I wake up during a day, if I have something come across my plate, say like I wake up Monday and some client sends me a note, that note will get shoved all the way over to Saturday when the when when my Saturday client time rolls around. And so it allows me to keep a clear head. Or if somebody shoots me a note on Thursday that has to do with the podcast, then I don't think about that or consider it at all until the following Wednesday morning, which is the morning on which I focus on podcasts. So that allows me to categorize stuff, to not have some long running to-do list that's never done. And it also allows me to get stuff in and out of my head as quickly as possible. So I keep a clear head and I'm never having to think about all the little tasks that I need to do. Um, one more productivity tip that, that I use that's that I think is really, really good is I have all push notifications turned off on my phone and turned off on my computer. So I don't get email unless I want to. I don't get a Facebook message unless I want to. And so I check email three times a day and I typically check Facebook. Um, I don't have a rule for that necessarily. It's just kind of like when I feel like it, but definitely not whenever somebody sends me a message. So for email, usually for me, it's like I, I do like a 9, noon, and 5, or sometimes it's more like a noon, 5, and 8.30 or 9 p.m. Usually those are kind of the, the two different scenarios that I work with as far as email checking, but turning off push notifications is really important for productivity as well so that you're focusing on what you want to focus focus on when you want to focus on it and you're not subject to the whims of other people. Very cool. And uh, you have an upcoming book. Come. It's called Beyond Training. Can you tell the audience a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, the actual book uh, website is at beyondtrainingbook.com. Um, it was actually all last week, uh, the, the number one book in health, number one book in fitness, and number one book in, in triathlon uh, in Amazon. Um, even though it's just on pre-orders right now, uh, because the hardcover isn't isn't ready to ship uh, quite yet. But what it is is it's a book that teaches you how to achieve amazing feats of physical and mental performance without destroying your body or your mind. And so a big big. Uh, part of of the lens through which I see the world is the fact that no matter how much performance we can squeeze out of our brains or squeeze out of our muscles, it's for naught if it's taking years off our life or if it's potentially dangerous or if, for example, we're looking really good and getting healthy on the outside while being sick on the inside or even vice versa. And so uh, what I teach in the book are all of the components necessary from a training standpoint a nutrition standpoint, a mental standpoint, um, and a lifestyle standpoint to be able to completely detox your body, detox your environment, and make the correct choices when it comes to you being able to achieve everything that you want to achieve in life while staying healthy at the same time. So there's a lot of stuff that's that's you know not in the book. Um, you know, we we take something like. Uh, um, modafinil, for instance, which is a really popular smart drug that a lot of people use. I haven't seen a lot of long-term studies that convince me that it's 100% safe, even though it's very efficacious. And so that's not one of the recommendations that I make in the book. Um, another thing that, that I would, for example, leave out of the book is uh, long running. So even for something like marathons or Ironman, I only run twice a week 
for a very short period of time because running is one of the more damaging things that you can do to your body. Does it make you fit really quickly? Yes. But does it also destroy your knees and your joints and lead to overtraining and ex excess cortisol production more quickly than just about any other form of training? Absolutely. And so, you know, running and, and strategies for learning how to run properly and minimize the damage that running does is something else that's in the book. So basically, I just go through everything that you could do to make yourself a really am amazing human body, but at the same time, do it without destroying your gut, your metabolism, your brain, your muscles, your joints, everything else. And so it's basically an, an atlas of healthy human performance. Very cool. And uh, how can some of the audience get... Get to know who you are, your blog, you have several websites. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Um, the For the book, it would definitely be beyondtrainingbook.com. For everything else, it would be bengreenfieldfitness.com. Finally, if you're a, if you're like a professional, like you're a whatever, a personal trainer or a nutritionist or a physician or something like that and, and you want to like – delve into some of the stuff that Eugene and I were talking about as far as like, you know, biomarker evaluation, stuff like that. I do have a private mentorship program that I run where I teach people those ways. And that's over at superhumancoach.com. And I do something, I do a 12 month certification called the superhuman coach certification. So very cool. And the final question, Ben, is if you could go back 10 years and give yourself advice 10 years ago, give that Ben advice in 2003. What well, what would three things you would tell them? Uh, skip college. Um, number two would be uh, travel less with my kids when they are babies um, because they don't really give a crap whether they're in Chile or Thailand or in their own backyard, and you wind up with a lot of heart rate. Hard eight traveling with children. So now I travel with my kids, but um, putting that on hold for a few years, I thought it would, be, it, was, it would be really cool to take my babies all over the world, and that turned out to be really stressful instead. So that'd be number two if you have kids. Yeah. If you're planning on having kids, um, don't don't be in a huge rush until they're old enough to actually appreciate the fact. So that'd be number two. Um, so skip college. Um, don't travel with babies, as exciting and and romantic as that might seem. Um, and then number three would be, um, I would say number three would be don't feel the pressure to finish the story. Like I, I, a lot of times when I, when I start a book, have to finish it and that's a really bad habit that I have that I've learned to wean myself off of, um, over the years, but I've spent many, many hours convinced that that I was going to find something really good in a book and, and it just never happened. So don't be afraid. If, if you get through, for me, it's about the first three chapters. If I get through the first three chapters of a book and there hasn't been a eureka moment, um, now I just put it down. I'm done with it. Yeah, that's why problem. that's that's why I freaking love Kindle now and the whole Kindle send sample. Yeah. Um, if I get through the sample of a Kindle book and, and there's not one page where I've learned something, laughed, or been entertained or had my had my thought provoked you know I'm, I'm done with it so um don't think that just because you you start a book you have to finish it and for me personally that's something i, I wish I'd, I'd have figured out longer ago i would have saved myself a lot of time very cool well then thank you so much for being on the show i really appreciated uh having you here and uh look forward to having you on here again sometime awesome that was fun uj i'm, I'm i was so happy, happy to do it and um yeah yeah. Cheers.